Okay, so um, I want to talk about a very contentious but I feel important subject, which is, I'll call it World War II revisionism. Now, um, there is many, many aspects to this, and I don't intend to cover them all in this video. Uh, I think I need videos, I mean, lots of them, to cover every aspect of this. Also, I'm not qualified to cover every aspect. I haven't really researched it that much in depth. So this is really just scratching the surface. I was watching a classic war film yesterday, The Longest Day. Uh, Daryl F. Sanook film, May of 1962. It had pretty much everyone who was anyone back then. Um, Henry Fonda, John Wayne, uh, Trevor Reed, uh, Kenneth Moore, just all, all the biggest names of that era, um, British and American. And it's about the D-Day Normandy landings. Um, but it also covers other aspects of it. It's a pretty good film. It's got some memorable scenes. It's black and white, which is unusual for a 60s film. Um, my only critique would be I think it underplays the Canadian role a little bit. I think they should have made a little bit more of the very important Canadian role in the Normandy landings. Uh, and they also portray the Germans in a, a fair light. I mean, they don't demonize them. They um, They have comical scenes, but they... There's one scene, for example, where they show two German airmen, I believe, saying uh, we probably won't come back, so they put a human touch there. Um, more recent war films have also been uh, more, shall we say, um, diplomatic in terms of how Germans are portrayed. And I'm okay with that. I think that is totally fine because outside of the SS and the... Um, the really hardcore aspects of the Nazi apparatus, most Germans were just ordinary people and they had no choice but to fight for the country or flee. Um, so I think that needs to be borne in mind. Uh, in fact, there's a new film out, I believe it's called Allied with Keira Knightley, and it's precisely about an uneasy relationship between a group of Britons and Germans living in post-war Hamburg. Um, okay. Let me just cut to the grit here. Um, I don't want to talk about the entire war. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about the Asia Pacific theater because that in itself is video worthy. There's a lot of uh, ghosts still lingering around from that because nationalistic sentiments in East Asia are still pretty raw, um, even 74 years on. In Europe, um, notwithstanding Brexit, we have, um, you know, relations are pretty strong for the most part um, and have been since World War II. Some credit NATO, some credit the EU, but regardless, um, the idea of two European wars going to, uh, excuse me, two European powers going to war with each other is almost unthinkable today. And that's a good thing. It should be that way. Um but, you know, I, I often look at the internet and, and when I come across any sort of videos that are anything to do with the Third Reich or the Nazi regime, almost inevitably you get people coming out of the woodwork to either make excuses for it, downplay it, or come out with blatantly um, neo-Nazi-esque comments. And they think they're being smart with the little 8-8 eight, eight references, which is a well-known uh, far right piece of symbology it refers to Hitler's birthday on the 8th of August um, so I find that very troubling the amount of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that are online things like for example uh, we were on the wrong side we should have let the Axis win um, Germany didn't really start the war Hitler had the right idea etc 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 and the internet is absolutely poisoned with this stuff you see it everywhere nowadays this is often the same people who claim that the zionists are really responsible for all the world's problems and mossad is behind every single conflict in the world um when you look at the mentality of some of these people you really get down to it um it's actually pretty toxic now, let me just be absolutely clear for the record. If you are supporting the Third Reich, 
If you're seeking to make excuses for it, downplay it, and you're British, I consider you a traitor. It sounds like an overused cliche. Our our grand, our uh, our ancestors fought against this generation. Um, my my grandfather was actually a little bit young. Um, he he served in the military after the war, but. I just find it staggering that there are still people who push that narrative now. Is World War II black and white? Is it evil versus good? No, it's not that simple. I, I totally agree with that. It's not that simple. For example, American units were still segregating black soldiers. Um, not exactly something to shout about when we know of um, the American effort in the war was called uh, you know, the arsenal of democracy. Well, it wasn't very democratic for black soldiers who were um, segregated. Something that was featured actually in the film Red Arrows. Um, the George Lucas film, I think it was called Red Arrows. Uh, and without question, the Allies done things that were not exactly noble. I mean, the firebombing of German cities like Dresden, like Hamburg. Um, Dresden had little military significance. And if you look at the World War II casualty statistics, Germany had far, far higher fatality rates, both military and civilian, than either the United States or the United Kingdom. Uh, in fact, if you look at, it's useful to compare it to World War One. If you look at World War One for the British Empire, or even if we narrow that down to the United Kingdom, uh, military fatalities were around 750 to 800,000 dead. World War II military casualties were something, I believe the figure was 380,000, so roughly half. Uh, although more civilians died in World War II in the Blitz. Um, in fact, here in Sunderland, some 273 civilians died. Um, I actually had an interesting conversation debates recently with my brother and some others about the nature of total war. Now, my understanding of total war is a war in which every aspect of society is somehow involved. So in that sense, neither the Iraq war or the Afghanistan war have been total wars. That doesn't mean that they're small affairs. It doesn't mean that they're minor issues. They're both major conflicts. Um, but to put things in context, um, 456 British servicemen and women died in Afghanistan. It's, it's a lot of people. But that would be a typical one R on the Western Front of the First World War. And some of the fighting in the, um, for example, the Battle of Guadalcanal with the Americans um, was that ferocious in World War Two. So that's what total war is. And if you want the absolute definition of total war, it has to be the Eastern Front. I mean, staggering, staggering losses, um, definitely on the Soviet side, but also on the German side, something that's often forgotten. In fact, Germany, I believe ranks third or fourth of all the World War II powers in terms of total numbers killed. Soviet Union was first, of course, then China. Um, and I believe it was either Poland or Germany that came next. Uh, but we're talking a lot of people died, um, you know, staggering death tolls in the millions. Whereas, like I say, Britain and the United States were each around half a million. Um now, in the, this is important. The reason I'm mentioning total war is because I think it's very important when we're talking about how we look at World War II from the prism of 2019. Um, the Allies done things that were less than noble. I'm sure there were um, Germans who were killed in cold blood. And, and without question, we killed German civilians. In fact, in this country for a long time, there was a bit of controversy over whether or not we should uh, honour Bomber Harris, Arthur Harris of the Bomber Command. Um, and to this day, the the airmen of World War II feel that they didn't quite get the recognition of the army and the navy, which is something given that 55,000 of them uh, died during the course of World War II. And the actual, although the overall casualty statistics were lower, the proportion was far higher. I read somewhere that in World War II, if you were in the army, the chances of being killed was 1 in 50. In the navy, 1 in 20. In the air force, 1 in 3. Now, don't quote me on that. It's something around that um, sort of proportion. Um, I mean, it was incredibly, incredibly dangerous. 
and the bravery of those young men was astounding. Um, British, American, Canadian, Polish, Czech airmen. Absolutely astonishing bravery. Um, but I think when we look at World War II, when we look at, for example, the fact that more people died in the bombing of Hamburg than the entire Blitz in Britain or France, I mean, around 68,000 people died in the Blitz in Britain collectively um, and hundreds of thousands wounded. But in the bombing of Hamburg, it's estimated between 30 and 70,000. Uh, Dresden also very high figures and other German cities were very high figures. Um, but I think it's important to remember that the Third Reich wasn't taking any sort of precautions when it was bombing British cities. I mean, Hitler boasted that he'd wiped Bristol off the map. And other port cities like Liverpool, the East End of London, Belfast, Hull, Portsmouth, Plymouth were absolutely obliterated. I mean, they were hammered night after night. One night in the East End of London, one and a half thousand people died. So it's all very well to say, yes, we've done terrible things in Dresden and Hamburg. Um, and Anthony Beaver, actually, in his extensive Second World War book, um, says we did come close to war crimes and the things that we've done. And I think we should recognise that, but I think we should also recognise that it was total war. So expecting the Allied side to be overly um, cautious when our civilians were being bombed day in and day out is a little bit naive, I believe. Um, that doesn't mean it's right. But I do think that when we're looking at the context, I mean, I don't think we can compare anything going on to the, today to the total war of World War II, unless you're in Syria, of course, or Yemen. But certainly for Western countries, I don't think that um, we, you know, the, the context of that time is uh, very important to consider. So I find it a bit galling when people say, would try to make it equal. They try to say, oh, the Allies were just as bad. Not at all. And I think this is a gross, perverse distortion of history. The Allies done bad things. They did. But anyone who really believes that that is comparable to systematic genocidal regime, like that run by Hitler um, and the, the leading Nazis, it, I mean, when you look at the likes of Joseph Mengele, Rein, uh, Reinhard Heydrich. For me, for, for people to make any sort of moral comparison, particularly with the United Kingdom, America was pretty racist. There's no question about that, the segregation that was going on. But I find it perverse when people try to make moral analogies, or at least make moral analogies on that scale. Um... And then you get into the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, oh, the Jews really started World War II. I saw a documentary about the Rothschilds recently. Um, now, without question, they're an immensely powerful family, an immensely wealthy family, no question about it. But I always see reading comments like, uh, this is the family that started two world wars. Now, that is pure anti-Semitic poison and lies. It's just lies. Um, uh, and I find it deeply troubling that there are people out there who genuinely with a straight face believe that Hitler wasn't culpa culpable for the war in Europe. Now you can argue that the unfair uh, balance of the Treaty of Versailles led to that resentment in Germany. I think it certainly played a part. You can argue that uh, the fact Germany suffered greatly from the Great Depression and all those factors of course they led to the Third Reich. But ultimately um, it was Hitler and his thugs who started World War II. Even if you don't believe the Holocaust happened, how do you explain uh, Germany's invasion of Poland? How do you excuse that? Germany's reckless invasion of the Soviet Union. Germany's brutal treatment of East Europeans. And true, the Soviets were just as bad in that theatre. The NKVD were in many ways just as sadistic as Nazi stormtroopers. And I do think there should be more films made about that. Bitter Harvest is a film about the Ukrainian Holodomor. 
But, you know, World War II was the biggest conflict in human history. It was the biggest event, I would argue, in human history. So we're going to be debating to the end of time about World War II, but we're still within living memory. Um, although the World War II generation are now getting older, the youngest ones are now in the early 90s. Because if you were 18 um, in 1945, you would be 91 now. So that's the youngest ones. But I find this revisionism um, and these attempts to make a moral comparison, at least on a level playing field between the Allies and the Axis, absolutely grotesque. What I would conclude with is, yes, the Allies did things that were, were war crimes. The mass bombing of German cities that killed innocent German civilians were war crimes. I didn't mention the A-bombs, incidentally. Um, that's a very difficult one. On one hand, it was evil because over 100,000 innocent people were evaporated in seconds. On the other hand, it is a fact that without the A-bombs bringing that immediate halt to World War II, and even Japanese politicians have conceded this, World War II would have dragged on. We know this because there were Japanese soldiers stuck in the jungle right up to the 70s. World War II would have went on. Millions more would have died. And those who, you know, talk about the A-bombs tend to forget just how awful Imperial Japan was. The things they'd done in China, the things they'd done in Indochina, the things they'd done in the Dutch East Indies, uh, the things they'd done to allied POWs, pure evil. Um, but the point about the A-bombs, it's irrefutable, absolutely irrefutable. It brought an immediate end to World War II. And I find that people who are loudest about the A-bombs tend to be on the far left or the far right. And they have this vested interest of getting into conspiracy theories that the West is to blame for everything. So the revisionism I see, and I've no doubt I will see it in the comments section when I upload this video, I find deeply unfortunate. In fact, for a long period, I'm going to round up very soon. But for a long time, right up to, I would say, the 70s, there was still deep anti-German sentiments in this country. And to some extent today, with the EU and Merkel, but particularly up to the 70s, there was very real bitterness um, because people still had the blitz in their memory. And that's understandable. And, you know, for my generation, we didn't go through that. So I suppose we can't judge. But I, for one, am very grateful that Europe is at peace today, a relative peace. Um... I am concerned about the rise in nationalism. I think there's a lot of factors for that, but that's for another video. Um, so I'll leave it there. This revisionism needs to be challenged. You know, people who insist the Holocaust didn't happen, as if all those camps at Auschwitz are just made up. I know there's a debate between Germany and Poland um, over the issue of concentration camps within Poland, because the Polish people suffered enormously. And Poland deeply resents any sort of notion that they um, collaborated or anything like that. Um, that's, that's again for another video. But I really think these conspiracy theories need to be challenged. Because really that's all they are. They have very little basis in fact. 